My name is Dave Wazirski. Uh, I was born in uh, Cheektowaga, New York, Buffalo, New York, and I grew up there. When I was in high school, uh, one of my uh, art teachers, uh, who knew I liked to draw and I liked science, had suggested there was a, a career in, in medical illustration, which I didn't know anything about at the time. So I registered in the fine arts program, uh, but took a lot of uh, life sciences and anthropology. Um, still didn't know that there were schools specifically for training medical illustrators, but I found that along the way. And uh, after my uh, third year at Buffalo State College, I applied to, the, to U of T, which is one of the only programs in North America. And uh, another school uh, was rejected by both schools. Um, but whereas the one school said, you know, just no thanks, come get your portfolio. Um, U of T uh, asked me to come up to get my work and they wanted to give me some advice as to how I could improve my chances for the following year. So I did all the things they recommended and, uh, and I was then accepted after my fourth year. So I ended up spending seven years working on a Bachelor of Science degree in, in medical illustration, which is maybe a little unusual, but um, it seemed to be okay. I was more interested in you know, having the skills and uh, wanting, wanting to work. Williams and Wilkins, who were the publishers of Grant's Atlas, uh, decided they wanted to embark on a huge um, renovation of the book. They were going to revise the entire book. Uh, and they wanted to add color because it was one of the only major uh, anatomy books still available, only in black and white, and they felt they were losing market share to remember full color books, you know, that looked kind of dated and old fashioned. So I was in the right place at the right time, and so I was asked uh, by uh, Anne, uh, who was going to be the author of this new edition, and my supervisor at, at IMS Creative Communications, if I was interested in working on illustrating or creating some new artwork for Grant's Atlas, which was, again, a remarkable opportunity. As students, of course, we all use grants and we spent time in the museum. And you know, we would say to ourselves, wouldn't it be great to have the chance to like draw, you know, this stuff for a new book or for a book or something. So um, that was a, almost a dream come true. Anne and I got to go down to Baltimore uh, to look at all the original art that was being stored at Williams and Wilkins. It had just been thrown in a wooden box for I don't know 30, 40 years. No one had looked at it. Uh, uh, so they just started pulling out all these amazing, beautiful carbon dust and pen and ink watercolor illustrations for us to look at and we kind of uh, triage which ones we wanted to keep in the book, some we weren't going to use any longer, and figure out which ones were missing and we would replace those with new images. And the goal with the new images was to match the style of the existing art uh, as much as possible. So the solution that we came up with was all the original black and white illustrations and all the new images that were created were going to be photographed and uh, printed on a, a plastic resin coated paper or photographic paper and then we hired a professional photo retoucher here in Toronto who had no knowledge of medical art at all. Uh, he would actually do all the hand coloring. So all those prints were hand colored. Uh, so we provided him with a palette and some samples and then he worked up how those colors would appear on the images and there was some back and forth to get the colors how we thought they should be. And then he proceeded to hand colorize all these uh, prints. So as the production went on with all these various complicated aspects of getting the work uh, organized, I started doing less and less work and more and more kind of wrangling, uh, working with the production manager at, our, uh, at IMS Creative Communications to whip everything into shape and into the publisher's hands in time for their publication deadline. The original drawings, uh, the original halftone illustrations, grayscale drawings, were created with uh, uh, two media, uh, either carbon dust or black watercolor wash. Most people understand watercolor wash is just a watercolor technique with black paint. Mm -hmm. And those drawings were, were by uh, Nancy Joy. Uh, Dorothy Chubb, who did the majority of the, the tone illustration, worked with a traditional media, um, a traditional to medical illustration called carbon dust. Um, it was originally uh, promoted by, or perhaps invented by, uh, Max Brady, who was the, uh, the, the director of the very first medical illustration program in North America at Johns Hopkins uh, University. This is an example of a carbon dust drawing by my teacher, Steve Gilbert. Um, and uh, what may not be so easy to see on the camera, but it's, it's rendered on a very particular kind of paper that's no longer available. It's a very thin coating of white clay on it. So that little bit of texture in the clay would hold that powder of a, of a sharpened carbon pencil. And as you would sharpen your pencil, you'd actually sharpen it on a piece of sandpaper or a file and collect the powder. That was the dust, the carbon dust, and people call it carbon sauce. Um, but you could use uh, flat, uh, flat brushes uh, like these to uh, dip it into that powder, and you could kind of gently stroke the surface with it and create these very soft, uh, beautiful tones. The final, uh, the final step in a drawing like this would be to, uh, to add the little, the brilliant white highlights that suggest the wetness of the texture. And those would be created by taking a small scalpel blade and scraping right into the surface of the paper. 
Well, actually, be, by carving into the surface, it was kind of a one-way trip. If you made a mistake, it was almost impossible to fix it. So it's always the scariest part of the drawing is adding those white highlights at the end. So um, every medical illustrator in North America that uh, attends a, an accredited uh, program has trained or would train in this particular uh, technique. But like I said, this paper is no longer available. Uh, it turned out that all the cardinal drawings that were created by uh, Dorothy Chubb were not done on this type of paper, but were actually done on another kind of paper, which, uh, and this is an example, not from Grants, this is one of my uh, drawings of another project. Um, so what she used instead was uh, the watercolor board, the same, the same type of paper board that we use for watercolor. So uh, differences are, uh, or similarities, it's, it does have a bit of a rough texture, so it holds the, the powder or the dust. Um, but you, because you can't scratch into it, uh, we would use, and, and, and Dorothy Chubb used, white paint. A little bit of opaque white paint for, for highlights, uh, for touching up some details. Uh, in this case, there should be a little opening here, which is almost impossible to not you know, get dirty as you're drawing. So at the very end, you just use some white paint and, and just fill those in. Um, people who train in fine arts look at a drawing like this and they think how awful you have to use white paint and you're correcting things. Um, but it's not meant to be fine art. And when it's reproduced, the, the little changes in texture or in lum uh, luminosity of the white from the paint or whatever, they don't show up. So it's, it's the end result that's important, how well it will reproduce. A significant moment for me uh, came at the completion of the, of the book uh, because the, the principal artists uh, of the original book, Nancy Joy and Dorothy Chubb, were still alive at the time. Uh, they've also passed away in recent years. Um, and we were kind of nervous about it because we were making a radical change to the book by adding color. And um, we weren't sure how they would feel about it, so we actually didn't talk to them about the book as we were producing it. They knew there was a new edition coming, but um, we were afraid they might be upset or, uh, or angry, and we didn't want that to complicate the production. The publisher didn't want that to complicate the production, certainly. But of course, at some point, you know, they wouldn't want to see the book. So. Um, uh, I had spoken to Dorothy Chubb a couple of times, working on the book because I had questions to ask her about her, her, how she did the work and her media and so on. So I, I promised her that when the book was finished, I would come to visit her and, and show her the book. So nervously, I went to her house and uh, we talked a bit and we sat on the sofa and I said, so I'd like to give you a copy of the new book. And I said, but I, I, I should warn you, we did make some changes and it's now in full color. And she kind of, oh, you know, I'm probably thinking, how could they have done that? Uh, because the technology wouldn't have been possible for her. So, you know, she took the book and she opened it and, oh, hmm, all right, well, I guess that's all right then. So she actually, she approved in the end, which we were very happy about. Being involved in that aspect of the, the production of the book, I'm quite happy with the color and I think it's very good. Yeah. Um, however, I understand the needs of, of anatomists and students and the publishers as well. So the newer edition, which has been recolored digitally, is much more vivid. I, I, I thought the color should be kind of subtle. Um, you know, some of them are a little brighter than others, but um, the color is, is a bit kind of low-key in what I thought was closer to, you know, kind of tissue color. Of course, with any medical drawing or any anatomical drawing, there's also symbolic color. So, uh, you know, just looking at the cover, arteries and veins aren't these colors in a, in a cadaver or even in a living body. Of course, arterial blood is a slightly brighter red because it's oxygenated, and the deoxygenated blood returning to the heart through the veins is a slightly darker color, blue, uh, bluish, you know, blue blood maybe, that's where that comes from. So, um, but to make the difference between the vessels clear in the illustrations, we have, we have through hundreds of years, used red to symbolize arteries and blue to symbolize veins. Yellow is typically used to symbolize nerves. Um, green, which is not a typical body color at all, um, is used, of course, in the gallbladder. The gallbladder is a kind of a brownish, greenish color. But we also use green uh, to maybe differentiate lymph nodes in the lymphatic system. In, in these kinds of drawings, because otherwise they all be more or less the same kind of colors. Mm -hmm. One of the gratifying things sometimes is uh, when uh, our students or other students that we that we met have looked through and they realize that uh, some of the pieces uh, they have my initials on them, and it's oh so you're the DM who, who worked on Grant's Atlas. It's well I worked on some of Grant's Atlas. Um, so this was uh, one of uh, Dorothy Chubb's original uh, carbon dust illustrations, and then this is a a drawing that didn't exist in the previous book. We added some more uh, sort of schematic uh, type illustrations. So they've added and taken out illustrations through various editions uh, to meet probably the, the kinds of feedback they would get from uh, faculty or students that use the book. You know, they're always striving to make the book as, as good as it can be so they can continue to, to, to sell it and make sure that it has a strong place in the market, which it does.